hi everybody russ from my hammers 11 i hope you're safe and well if you're new to the channel please consider subscribing hitting the bell icon so you know every time we put new videos on as always we'd like to thank our channel sponsors untuck it so check them out in the description below lots of black friday deals for your untucked shirts and t-shirts and stuff like that so keep an eye out for them we have another x hammer playing for playing for us uh, talking to us today um and very very honored um every time we get an ex west ham player on today's guest um he played now i figured it out tom it was exactly a hundred appearances you made for the club in total across all competitions apparently including the full members clubs and stuff like that so um <laughs> it's mr tom McAllister. how are you how are you tom ross i'm very well thank you um nice to be talking to you and chatting with you well, there's nothing else to do at the moment, is there? We're all in lockdown again, so it's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, you, if you put it like that, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure if it, we hadn't, uh, it hadn't been locked down, we'd have still chatted anyway. How, how are you, Tom, in this sort of weird world we're living at the moment? Um, yeah, thanks for asking. I'm fine. I'm doing okay. Um, I have had a couple of bad, um, what you call, circumstances a few years ago, but I'm sure for those okay. My health's fine. I'm doing okay. Good good that's the main thing isn't it? as long as your health's okay at the moment but yeah. uh but yes and obviously i mean we're in this weird world at the moment but you know the football's still carrying on so that's all right who's got something to moan about haven't we at the moment but uh certainly certainly the football these days and um things like vr give it let you moan about it that's for sure <laughs> it's something different to distract the public's you know, rather than all the doom and gloom with everything around the virus, it's it gives us a distraction, doesn't it, for 90 minutes. And probably about two days afterwards, going through and looking at salad diving or son diving or VAR and, oh dear, keeps us on our toes, doesn't it, Tom? It does indeed. Oh, it's always been the same um, as far as I can remember the football. It's the match day and then two or three days afterwards analysing and who was right and who was wrong. Yeah. And then you go on to the next match. Yeah, so true. It's so true. And even more so at the moment because obviously we've got the international break now, but, you know, there's there's a procession of, of games every day. Is, you know, and so there's always something more to talk about to add to the pot. So it, it keeps us all on, you know, on our toes and keeps us... Um, when, that, when we had that sort of 100 days of no Premier League football, it was like, it was awful, wasn't it? It was like, <laughs> it was like a, a elongated um, end of season, wasn't it? Yes. You know, it's... You're just thinking, well, it will start in a few days, or it will start in a couple of weeks, and it just seemed to go on forever and ever and ever. And um, it was very strange. Very yeah, strange. It, was, it was. It was. And then we had that sort of deluge of games, didn't we? It was like a, it was almost like a World Cup, wasn't it? It was like every day, like four games of that. And I couldn't keep up, to be honest. I'm, I'm glad it settled down a little bit, to be fair. But, uh, yeah. And West Ham are doing all right at the moment, aren't we? They're doing good. They're doing very good. Um I don't think they're doing any more than a reasonable person would expect them to do. No. You know, I think when they're struggling a little bit, people are very surprised at that. Certainly people who have been associated with the club. I think they're doing OK and I think they'll have a good season, yes? Yeah, I think we will. I think uh, I think your man Moyes has got a, got a bit of a tune out of him and I think he's the right man for the job. I'm very... Um, it just seems, you know, I mean... We talk about, you know, when, when new managers come in and new regimes and stuff, they talk about a project, don't they? We want to want to start a project or, or players get attracted by a project. And actually, now I can see a project being built. Do you know what I mean? He just seems to be putting the right pieces, the right backroom staff, getting the right recruitment in. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful for a good season this season. And obviously on Saturday, beating Fulham, you know, traditionally we – we always stumble when we play the teams we should be beating, you know, and so it was nice to win a bit ugly on Saturday. Yeah, we should have. Yeah, of course <laughs> it is, yeah. Um, but going back to David Moyes that what's happening there, I think he's got his, his game plan there. He's got yeah. his, his pieces, as you say. It's just whether he's going to be allowed to, to get on with that. You know, there's always people mm. above or on the outskirts who can block those things. But if he's left mm. to do his thing, I think he'll be fine. Yeah, definitely. And I think we need that at the moment. You know, we need some stability. Obviously, you know, during your days, you had, you know, managers were there for a long time um, and building, like building sort of a succession plan and building, building and building. But with chopping and changing managers, not just at West Ham, but obviously the, the modern day, you don't get that sort of, 
at sort of you know almost like a historical you know it was like a succession plan wasn't it at west ham during the days where you know you had greenwood then you had lyle and it was like and then lyle was looking at people who could become coaches and stuff and you don't get that now it's almost chopping and changing all the time isn't it which is which is a shame really because um you don't get that sort of that sort of lineage anymore now which is um which is all i don't enjoy it really because everything changes new manager comes in he brings all his new staff in new players and you just don't know where you are as a club really unfortunately invariably, but, invariably uh, that lasts for maybe two or three years and then it all starts again yeah you know exactly so this going is... going back to my time with when john lyle was there he 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 told me something he probably told a lot of the players the same thing he didn't change but every three two or three years he would change certain players he knew yeah. that it was time to get get them somewhere else and bring in other players. So it, mm. the structure was always the same, but it was just the the players changed slightly. You know, yeah. so John had a, a good game plan like that. Yeah, so there was like a common thread, wasn't there? You know, he just the pieces would be interchangeable to keep keep that sort of story going, isn't it? The characters will change, but yeah. the story and the outcome is the same. Um, I mean, I mean, for, that, for those of you who are who are what's the word? Um, less experienced fans that we'll, we'll call them less experienced fans you might not know tom's tom's career particularly well so we'll be going through it and talking about it but obviously tom tom joined um in the early 80s in 81 i believe and what i usually do tom is when we have fans come on i ask why they become a west ham fan but for players i ask why they became a west ham player so why how did how did it hold all how did the transfer um you know you signing for west ham how did that all start what was the what was the story behind it well, initially, to say why did I become a West Ham player, I think yeah. to use a modern phrase, it would be a no-brainer yeah. and to have the chance <laughs> and not take it. Um, the situation was, Russ, I, I was treading water. I was in the third division with Swindon Town. I couldn't get a game. Yeah. So they loaned me out to Bristol Rovers for the last two months of the, that season, which coincidentally was the season that West Ham got promotion. Yeah. And Bristol Rovers were fighting relegation. Um, and West Ham were apparently going to sign the Bristol Rovers goalkeeper, a young lad, Phil Knight, I believe he was called. So they kept sending in Ernie Gregory, Uncle Ern, down to watch Bristol Rovers. But I was playing, and I was just having a period there that was like playing for fun. Everything I did worked. Yeah. So on the last game of the season, we had to come to Upton Park. Uh, the Hammers had to win to win the championship. And we had to win to stay up. Well, mm. it was only going to go one way, to be honest with you. Um, but West Ham beat us 2-0. And that was the only game that the Rovers lost while I was there. So that was it. We were off on the bus back to Bristol. I went home to Swindon. My loan period at Bristol Rovers was up. I was back at Swindon under contract there. And I got a call on the Monday morning from the Swindon manager, a chap called John Trollope to go in and speak to him. So I went in, see what was happening. And he says, I'm not sure if you'd be interested in this, Tom, but we've had an offer from West Ham if you would like to join them. So I looked at this chat like, unbelievable. I said, John, I'm in the third division with you and I can't get a game. West Ham, I'm in the first division. They want to sign me. Why are you asking me the question? <laughs> so, you know, that was it. I, and then I... I, there was an arrangement to meet John um, in a hotel for yep. lunch, and it went from there. Um, he, he didn't have to sell the club to me, obviously. No. He just had to tell me what what he expected from me, and it was a done deal within yeah. half an hour. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic, it, and obviously like me. So and obviously, kind of... no, but say, and obviously, you know. He said he, he took half an hour to really sort of iron everything out. Meeting, you know, obviously Miss Mr. Lyle. Um, we've heard I've heard loads about him from from players and fans and stuff. And what what was it about John that, that just? I mean, you already to be honest, you it's a bit of a slam dunk in American terms, weren't it? In terms of you already wanting to sign for the club, but obviously meeting John and um, sitting down with him um, must have just tipped you over the edge, really, in terms of signing. They were, they were, I think if the first thing that came over, Rossi, was his honesty. Yeah. That, that's, that's, that's the first thing that came over. Um, his, his first opening comment to me was, hello, Tommy, you're taller than I thought you were. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we sat down, we had lunch with uh, one of the uh, Swindon Town 
I don't know, executives or something, someone sure. I knew from Sheffield. So having a bit of banter, and John says, would you be interested in Tom? I says, yes. But he says, there's one little problem, Mr. Lyle. I says, I mowed some money from Swindon Town. Yeah. And this chap says, well, you can, you're going to West Ham, you don't need it. The conversation was going like that. So John interrupted, pay the boy his money, whatever, and it got that sorted out. He says, come on then, Tommy, we'll go to the car and you can sign the contract. So I went to the car, sat down, explained to me in terms of the contract, how long it was, what the salary yeah. would be, uh, bonus fees, etc., etc. I says, yeah, lovely, thank you. Give me the contract. So he handed me the contract and Russ, there was nothing on it. It was a blank contract. And I, I, I said, but Mr. Lyle, there's no nothing, no figures on this. And he says, I've told you what you'll get, Tommy. I've told you the deal. Yeah. And he looked at me and I looked at him and I thought, yeah, I trust yeah, him. Trust him. Signed man. the contract. I didn't tell my wife when I went home. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't tell her to sign a blind contract. But yeah, so yeah. that was it. It was just came across immediately as an honest fella and you, you knew what you were getting. And that's yeah. how it worked out. Fantastic. It's, it's, that's, that's, that must be also, it must be one of his one of his things, you know, just, you know, you trust me, yeah? You trust me now. This is completely a blank, you're going to sign a blank contract and stuff like that. That's that's incredible. Absolutely incredible. Mm-hmm. That the, just the honesty that he could portray and you could like take that in, you know, and be, yeah, yeah I'll sign this sure. contract. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. And obviously, you're moving, obviously, Swindon, back to Swindon to, you know, to play for West Ham and obviously, you know, then going back and telling your wife. Um <laughs> <laughs> not about the not about the contract obviously um what well, i mean obviously you know we, we came to you, that, that sort of period where we, we obviously west ham were promoted and there was the fa cup final and stuff like that was was there any what's the word i'm thinking about was was there any apprehension turning up at training the first training session and it's obviously you know from swindon now you're now you're playing at west ham and it won the fa cup and stuff like that recently and uh yeah. all these sort of not superstars but all these sort of players now um what was it like going in the first training session at general reef uh, it, it it was it, it was quite strange to be back in in a club at that level sure. um, but bearing in mind i you know, I'd been a professional footballer from 17. Of course. And I'd, I'd played in the old first division with chefs. So I was quite well experienced. Mm. But the moment I walked into Chadwell Heath, about half past nine in the morning, John says, hi, introduced me to the staff, got me a cup of tea, I sat down, and and he says, uh, Tommy, I want you to meet Ray, Ray Stewart. He says, he'll yeah. take care of you. Everything yeah. you want, ask him. And from that was it, Ray, you know, he was my buddy all the way through. Uh, and every player that came in, uh, they were amazing. You know, it wasn't yeah. they were the they were those players, and I was some second class player coming in. They just took me as I was. It was fine. Yeah, really, really nice bunch of chaps. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, you know, and as we, when we just before we started recording, you know, we were talking about we, we go to the, talk about the eleven a bit later on. But you know, you said you know looking back, at just the the caliber and the number of fantastic players that you played with. I mean, you was there from eighty one to eighty nine, I believe. Yeah, that that was you know in terms of the modern West Ham history, that was our pomp, really, wasn't it? We had the eighty three, eighty four season, eighty five, eighty six. And and you know, unfortunately, you know, it's it's like you know, because I was I was going through all the all the stats, and obviously that eighty four eighty five season where you know you were you were you were really good. Yeah, that was that was a great season. And then you got injured just in the April, and and very similar to Billy, actually, you missed that whole eighty five eighty boys of eighty six season, didn't you? Unfortunately, um, yeah. I think it was was it two years. I think it was literally two years to the day. I think you I think you got injured on the eighth of eighth of April. And I think you played the next game. It was the Arsenal game, eighth of April, two years later. What's that like being out for such a long period? Um, in most, uh, to be honest, my experience, Russ, at other clubs, it'd be annoying. I yeah. think that's the best word. Yeah. Um, but there, there, it was fine. For some reason, you know, you, you knew that you were still being treated fairly. You were yeah. still appreciated, and if the opportunity arose or the need arose, you would be back playing where you hoped to be. So yeah. it, when you're injured, you're frustrated. Um, mm. But when you're fit again and can't get in the side for various reasons, it's annoying. But there, it, it didn't enter my mind, you know. Yeah. It sort of took me back to 
the initial reason I was taken there was to be an understudy to Phil. Yeah. But, you know, obviously, after having played for a while, you think, well, I'm, I'm slightly better than that. But it was still a case of accepting the scenario. Again, it sure. goes back to John, because if, you know, if the circumstances were right, John would put me in mm. if the opportunity arose. So I was fine with that. Yeah. yeah. And it's sort of like, you know, obviously, because it was like, so 84, 85, and then obviously, then like you had 87, 88, where you played, I think you only missed one game as well. So it's almost like you were, you and Phil were doing this, you know, sort of t- tag teaming each other for the seasons. And uh, I mean, it's, it's, you know, obviously I did, I was did a little bit of research when I was when I was looking at it. I was looking at eighty four eighty five season, and I and I saw the uh, the penalty save at the Watford game. You know, because Graham Taylor's team were flying then, and you saved uh, Sterling's penalty, didn't you? Or, or Sterling's penalty, and um, and also was it the is it the Chelsea game where there was I think it was Colin Lee. You saved the penalty, rebound was scored. The ref then made it be to be taken and exactly the same thing happened again um that was that was a that was a great season for you personally wasn't it the 84 85 season i think yeah yeah it was um those type of seasons f- when things are going well for you, you yeah the season just flows you know you're enjoying it you're having fun you're taking it serious but you seem to have a thing in the back of your head that whatever you try to do is going to happen and i suppose yeah. that's the same for any outfield player as well you know sure. if it's going well they're enjoying it and you're not worried about the next game and then that. So it was good. Uh, you know, periods like that are fine. Yeah. Really. It is, I know what you mean. It, it, yeah. You saw that. You said, you know, they can, and it's it's same with teams, isn't it? Sometimes teams just have the luck. So, um, so you have that luck, don't you, where, you, you know, everything just falls for you down at the moment. So um, that was definitely that period. And, Obviously, you know, we, I mean, as I said, you know, for some people, for those people, they're not less educated, but they're less experienced. Obviously, the 80, the 83, 84, we were sort of riding high as a club and we just fell by the wayside and finished ninth. Obviously, everyone knows about 85, 86. Um, and it just seemed to be, you know, a really, a really sort of really good period for West Ham in terms of league success, you know, because we were sort of riding high and it was really, you know, I was unfortunately wasn't sort of wasn't really following football at the time i was only for about four or five sorry john sorry everybody time at the time you know um but it was but going back... <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> but looking back at it um obviously for the highlights and stuff now it's, uh, it's a it was a, it was a great time as you said in terms of west ham and you know mr mr la was the person who, who made it wasn't it in terms of that but as you said the characters you know you had some real characters i mean obviously you know, there just seemed to be a, a constant procession of characters, wasn't there? So they brought new, new blood every sort of couple of seasons, and uh, each one sort of carried on with the last one carried off, really, wasn't it? In terms, what was yeah. the what was the dressing room like? It must have been a, a real good, fun dressing room, I think, with those characters. Yes, it it, it was a happy dressing room. Um, as it, and go back for a moment there and say, even the players that thought they should have been in or weren't yeah. in the team, they were still part of it. Um. And yeah, it was full of different sorts of people. You know, you had um, Billy, who, you know, Bonzo, he walked in. He wasn't the, the most chatty, over, loud person, but you knew he was there. And if he had something to say or whatever, yeah. then you had your, you know, the dev. The dev, you know, just wouldn't shut up. He was always coming out <laughs> with, with jokes like that, you know, and you'd get somebody who would always bounce off him. Uh, Tonka, Ray Stewart, he always has something to say, but it was, <laughs> Most gr- more like grumpiness, you know. But it was great. It was a really, really good place to be. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And the one thing I can say, um, unless I've forgotten, <laughs> I never saw players fall out or have arguments in the train on the training ground, in the ch- uh, the changing room, or on a match day. Yeah. You know, nobody turned around and pointed fingers or blamed somebody for this or something for that. It was just everybody was in it together, and that's the way it was. And that was important. And you got that sense of team spirit. I mean, even now, you know, obviously everyone sort of seems to be in contact with each other and stuff like that. And it's, it's again, it's it's indicative of, of, of football at that time where people would stay around for a, a fair whack of time, wouldn't they? Not just the managers, but the players as well. You know, we had, um, we had Reg on and um, Reg was saying he's, he's every, I think he was there for 11 years or something. Like, every year bar one was a testimonial year. And um, and that just breeds that togetherness, that team spirit, isn't it? And um, it, you just get a real sense of that when you talk about people who have played in in your era at West Ham. 
they've all they've all got that togetherness and as you said like the tonka and you know and you know you probably still chat to them all and i know that obviously you know we know len old len herbert bless him and uh and he does all the you know the, the the evenings when we can go back and do evenings would be good so it's great all, all you guys still sort of you know converse with one another. i mean i don't see that now in the modern day do you know what i mean <laughs> i wouldn't yeah. see in about 30 years time felipe anderson turning up to the frinton golf club and doing an evening <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> no I, I think you're right there but, but i think that goes down to the, the modern football players they know they maybe do two years at one place and yeah. they know they're going to move on um so the, there's not the time there to develop those relationships uh, as as it was back in the day with us you know so yeah, yeah i think the modern day game's got a lot to do with that yeah it has it has you know the money in the game and 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 i think you know it's it, obviously with that money it becomes a career doesn't it rather than a passion um and yeah you know, obviously you were you were earning money of course you know and do it for free but it it, it just breeds a different type of person uh, and I think you do get, and then you get people like Mark Noble, for example, who is an exception to the rule in the modern day. He was, he would have been one of many in, in, in your era, so to speak, in terms of 10 years at a club and one man clubs and things like that, where now he's almost the exception to the rule. And it's a shame because I just think it's not just the players, but I think it's, it's the fans as well. They never really have be able to get a bond with a player because we know they're probably going to leave after about three, two or three seasons, isn't it? Where it's yeah, people like yourself, people like you said, Phil and, and Ray and all those, they're still revered when they come back to London stadium and, or even the, the, the evening things that you guys do. So it's, it's not just the players, but I think it's the fans. And I think that's something which is a shame because I think the modern fan misses out on that. That's my, that's my personal. I, I have, I go on my high horse when I talk about that. Even sort of for me, my, my, my sort of, my sort of era was the more sort of mid nineties, early to mid nineties. And so even that, you know, for me, Ian Bishop and John Moncur and Pete Butler and people like that, Ludo, they were sort of my, you know, yeah. they're, they're, they were there for a long time as well. It's the same thing, but from then on it's went downhill a bit, but, uh, but that's the thing. Let's, let's go on to this 11, because I know you've been struggling with this um, Tom, because <laughs> as you, as you said, you know, eight, nine years, of the club, a lot of good players have come, come and gone in that time, and stayed. At, some were still still there when you was when you was playing all the way through. So, um, the the only rule we 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 invoke is you must have have, have played. You know, it's the players you've played with, basically. So, um, as you said, you know, there's a, there's a whole raft of players. So, I can see I can see there's a bit of sweat dripping down your tummy. You know, worrying about some of these decisions. But apart from that, you can talk about whoever you want. But uh, obviously, you can do my honourable mentions as well. So, I'm sure there will be some. Um, let's let's start off. Let's start off in goal, then, Tom. Who's going to be in goal for the Tom Eleven? Well, it's not going to be me, right? <laughs> and as, if the, as there were only two of us there, it's Phil. Um, yeah, I can. Uh, I, I've read, I've read passages, and I've heard people say you couldn't replace. You know, you couldn't be in a club with Phil without him playing. You know, he was. Yeah. He was the best goalkeeper I've ever been associated with. So yeah, Phil's there without a doubt. And obviously, you know. We know the goalkeeper union and everything like that. Obviously, you you know you train together and stuff. So you know you probably had a stronger bond with Phil than probably most any any of the other player really because you were there all the time with Phil. And as you said, training each day and competing with one another. And obviously, when one was injured, the other took over and stuff. It was um, it must have been a, a a lovely relationship to have because although you're competing, you're still part of the same team, isn't it? Really, in terms of how it works. That's correct. Um... The, the, the playing with it, it was a good relationship, but the, the competition thing sort of went to the back of the head. Sure. But I didn't I didn't look on it as competition. I just looked on it as working with someone, uh, learning from someone. Um, I think he also appreciated that there was somebody behind him. That, yes. That could do they could do a job. Mm. So it wasn't so much the competition. It was just an acceptance that if one of us, whoever was in, deserved to be in, and I certainly didn't think I deserved to be in when Phil was fit. Um, sure. He he was the he was the player. Yeah. Sure. But, sure. Sure. You know, yeah. No, totally. That makes that's that's a really honest way of, of saying it, Tom. Uh, I really appreciate that. Right. 
Okay, dokie. So Mr. Parks is in. Um, and because also, you know, that, that if you play, it'd be 101. And I quite like the fact that you was on the 100. That's that's really unusual on the, on the full number. So um, <laughs> when I counted it, I was like, that right, I've got to redo it. Because, you know, because everyone always feels like, you know, Potsy was 499 and and uh, and Billy was like 69. You know, everyone finishes on an odd number, but it was like bang on 100. Oh, fair play. Um, right, okay, Tom. Um, are we going to play four at the back or are we going to do something? What's up to you? Ross, that's the only way I know. Good. That's, <laughs> you know, that's I it. Am, that's I, it. I'm old school. <laughs> right, let's um, go left yeah. back. Who would be left back? Left this would be interesting. Um, again, some of the players that were there when I was there, and I mm. maybe only played a handful of games, uh, don't deserve to be left out. But again, the only person I can put in there is Frank. Yeah. You know, he was there when he was there when I joined. He was there when mm. I was playing. And he was there and I left. And I just think, yeah, put him in there without a doubt. Yeah. Because so you would have played, player. you played a handful of games with Julian, if I remember, towards the end of your of your time at West Ham, wouldn't it, as well? So, um, but as you said, Frank was there. And Frank's one of those players, I, you know, I'm, I, it's one of my new, my new sort of, um, no, I, don't, I can't remember the word. My, my brain's gone to mush, but it's one of my new things. I want to try and get some more recognition for Frank because he doesn't seem, he's never, he's always, he's not, never, you know, considering how many games he played for West Ham and, 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 and the period he played for West Ham, you know, he, he doesn't get the recognition he deserves, I don't think, in the modern day because may, maybe because of his son and, you know, the connotations so and stuff. But it's a shame because the man was, was West Ham through and through and, you know, to play, you know, as many games as he did and not have that sort of recognition outside of people who are, you know, because obviously I know about, you know, Bobby Moore and Billy Bonds and all that type of, but Frank Lampard senior is almost seen as not the afterthought, but it's like a, you know, he's the next one down and he should be up there with them guys. And, um, yeah, and, absolutely. And, I think, I think Ross, if I could maybe uh, shed a little bit of light on sure. that, I don't think Frank would be annoyed with me. He wasn't the one who interacted a lot with the with yeah. his, the fan. Frank yeah. was a private. You know, he he did it. He came to work, did his training, um, played his football, and kept himself more off the field. Kept himself to himself. Um, yeah. Quite quite a private person. Maybe surprised a few people, but perhaps that's why, um, in hindsight, he doesn't quite get the recognition that a lot of. A lot of the other players got, yeah. but he certainly deserves it. You know? Yeah, interesting. Yeah, no, no, I didn't done that, but that's, that's useful to know. Um, you're right. It might might be just the interaction thing. You could be say because I, I think that's the same in, in the modern day. For example, we've got um, I look at two 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 cents. I look at uh, James Collins and Winston Reid. Both both played roughly the same amount of time at West Ham, but everyone sort of and everyone sort of talks about Winston Reid, but everyone talks about James Collins, you know, because he's and it might be because he it was you know it's the passion and and you know where Winston Reid was. You know, he was New Zealand, a little bit less, a little bit more reserved and stuff like that. And so, you know, it's interesting how how the interaction with the fans sort of emulates in terms of how, you know, they're, they're considered in, in the future and stuff. But, um, yeah, it's interesting about Frank Lampard. Senior, if, right? I can just, if I can just add a little anecdote on to that. Um, Frank being Frank, although he didn't interact with them, the fans thought he was, you know, he was what he was. He was, yeah. if, if he says something happened. And I played a match at Coventry. And I liked playing at Coventry. It was a nice ground. And yeah. I was at the West Ham end, and the crowd are like Upton Park, very close to you. Mm. And I recall this time I took a cross coming from the left wing, so the right back position. I crossed it, and Frank's at the opposite side of me. He shouted at me, Tom, throw it. So I turned around and I went to throw the ball to him, and he just laughed and walked away. And I'm standing <laughs> with this ball, not knowing what to do with it because it's half in and half out. <laughs> and I, some, I bounced it and caught it in the crowd. I went, yeah, go on, Frank. You tell him off and you do this. You know, so they knew, you know, he, he sort of had a quiet interaction with the supporters. Yeah. But if he did something or said something, they were on his side. You yeah, know? They, yeah, of course so they a were. a bit of fun at my expense, but that was yeah. all right. <laughs> but that's the thing and it's about you know and and, and again you know it, it's one of the things that i think I, I miss slightly in terms of the modern day football is having a laugh do you know what i mean it's mm -hmm. so serious football is now of course the money and stuff it makes it so serious little things like that little jokes during the game 
it just it's in, we need to be entertained at the moment don't we with everything that's going on in the world so be, it's yeah. yeah so right okay we'll put frank senior in left back let's go the other side let's go the right back i could probably guess who your right back's gonna be well i don't think um, <laughs> again with all the all the players that are around some will be a, this not disappointing it's only my choice but there's only ray you know yeah from the yeah. Day, day one to the day i left um ray stewart was one of the best players i've played with there yeah. That was shot. yeah top guy top guy top. and and Absolutely. and and even now you know it's just like you know he's, he's, a, he's a lovely bloke and he's just a yeah you know, as you said he so to speak yeah john you know he was your if you wanted anything go to ray type thing and yeah. and so you obviously had that, had that that bond as well with him so uh lovely he, guy he was, um, ray was a hundred mile an hour player in person on the pitch yeah. 100 mile an hour he couldn't stop talking he was always up and down and off the pitch he couldn't stand still there was always he was always doing something he was out he was doing something phoning you up to go somewhere you know and it was it was just a, a bundle of energy but yeah. one hell of a player a really yeah, definitely. good player. Yeah. And and considering we we've been talking about penalties recently we obviously uh Lookman's um pe- penalty against us on on Saturday that's how you take a penalty. Our Tonks used to take a penalty, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I <laughs> know what. Yeah, carry on. Sorry. No, you, you carry on. Go on. You carry on, Tom. Go on. I, I think um, going all the way back to the very beginning, the match I played at Upton Park when they got promotion, I think their second goal was a penalty. Yeah. And Tonka took it. So I knew what it was all about after that. But yeah, he had, he had no fear with that, you know? And the one thing I don't recall, uh, Russ. He was ever practicing penalties in training. Really? I don't recall him. Yeah. You know, he would never say, Tom or Phil, can you line up for 20 minutes while I practice penalties? It, it was just a natural thing to him, you know, yeah. which is um, quite, a, quite a wonderful thing. You know? Oh, definitely. But no one does that anymore. No one just hits it. Do you know what I mean now with penalties? Everyone sort of ch- ch- plays it or tries to dink it or places it where, you know, even and he, you know, even after Tom come, Julian, he the same thing, would just hit it as hard as he could. And if the goalkeeper's in the way, poor goalkeeper, wasn't it really? But uh, yeah. that's why you need to take penalties particularly. But yes, okay. It doesn't, I don't care because we've got three points out of it. So it's all right then. <laughs> as long as Mark Nable doesn't do that, I don't care. I don't think he would. Right, let's go into the centre half position. Then, Tom, who would your first centre half be? Um, well, when I played there, obviously Billy was. Billy played centre half with me. Now, yeah. it was. I was informed after after I left actually that when I, I was being interviewed for a, for his book, that he was actually a midfield player that he started his career in midfield. Um, but by the time I got there, it was centre half, and man, what a centre half he was! Yeah. You know, um, if the if a tackle had to be made, it was made. If it had to be headed, had to be headed. Um, yeah. It was he was just there. He was he was like a rock. Um, and I remember on my debut, he he said to me, "Good luck, Tommy." He says, "But the only thing I'll say to you, if I can head that ball, you stay on your line." Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll deal with it because I, I, in my career, for what it's worth, I was very good and very confident taking crosses in sure. any part of, of the 18 yard box. That's what I was brought up as. Yeah. Um, but that was his opening gambit to me as I walked out of the dressing room. If I can head it, you stay on your line and I'll head it. Brilliant. And I thought, that's fair enough for me, Billy. I'm not arguing with you. Nah, and that's how that's it was. Good. Yeah. But, and um, just brilliant. Yeah, wonderful. But he could play as well. Yeah. And the thing is, one of the things that always sticks in my mind, it was like a a minder for for Sir Trevor. Yeah. If anybody ever touched Trev, um, <laughs> the rest of the players could take take care of themselves, but they wouldn't do it twice. You would see <laughs> bombs would go up, have a quiet word in the person's ear, and if they did it again, they were mad. But invariably, they, they wouldn't tackle Trevor again because you know Billy always had his back. Um, and I think that's that was a that was a, an exceptional thing that in those days, you know, um, Trevor wasn't a tackler, he wasn't a violent physical person, but yeah, Billy always had his back. So that's something else that stuck out with me with him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and that's that's the thing, you know, with Billy, you know, he just seems he just seemed to be this guy who, you know, he was just totally dependable. And, and obviously he was Mr. West Ham and, you know, playing into his sports early forties and still, you know, being the fittest man on the pitch 
um just an incredible human being you just seem to be an incredible human being and and again very quiet man off the pitch by all accounts you know a you know, very family man and, and stuff like that which is um which surprises some people doesn't it because they're so ferocious on the pitch and then yeah. as soon as they yeah. off the line that's when i'm going going back to the kids now it's like you know fair enough that's right? that's one thing i do remember about billy and i respected <laughs> him he was, he was a family man he was a private yeah. person um occasionally we talk about his girls but you know, if he did his training, anything he had to do after that, he did it. But he was always home to his family. You know, he was yeah. um, very family oriented person. Lovely stuff. Okay, we'll put Billy in. Who's Billy gonna partner in that centre back position? Then who's gonna who's gonna be that sort of rock to go with Billy? You know, there are as I keep going back to Ross. There's players there. There's Gary Strader that came in after a while. Paul Hilton, yep. a very very underestimated centre half. Great player, fabulous fun. But, you know, if you've got an England international playing alongside somebody, then it's got to be Alvin, hasn't it? Yeah. You know? Yeah. But it, it, as I say, it's difficult, but I can only go off at the time and the place. Um, and Alvin, a giant of a centre half, good player, and an England international. So that he's in there along, alongside Billy. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a solid pairing, isn't it? <laughs> God. When it, when it was working, it was working. Yeah. You know? um, and it invariably was working. It didn't mean we won every game or didn't lose any goals. But, yeah, again, you have to remember there were good players up against them. But they were oh, of course. Uh, a good twosome. A good twosome yeah. in harmony. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, right. We'll put we'll put, uh, we'll put Sir Alvin in. Um, right. So let's move into midfield then, Tom. Um, we're going to we – sh- what, what, four in midfield? Four midfield? Yeah. I say that's what I'm used to. Two yeah, wide, good. two Just, in the middle. Yeah, that's it. Okay, we'll go. Let's go left, left mid, left wide, left wide, left midfield, left wing, whatever you want to call it. Who should we put on there then, Tom? <laughs> is there any, is there any doubt or any argument that it'd be Alan Devonshire? No, I was about to say I could probably <laughs> guess that one. Yeah, <laughs> what an incredible player! Just a fabulous player. Um, it, it was. I, 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 wa- I used to just watch him the five asides that we played indoors or on the training pitch. Just give him the ball and you might as well have yeah. just walked away because whatever he wanted to do, he did it with that ball. You know, yeah. it was just amazing. Um, a talent, uh, I, I have no understanding why he didn't get picked for England is more than I think he did get picked. But yeah, yeah not he, that many. He, he, he would have been in there all the time, you know. But maybe yeah. it's because he was such an individual. You had, to, I think, you had to play with Al to understand him, um, because you knew, give him the ball, and you knew what was going to happen. But if, mm. I think if you played against him or watched him, you just think, what's he doing? But he knew what he was doing. He was, yeah. Yeah, he was just, ama- just amazing, amazing, yeah. what a funny such lad. A... Yeah, you know, nice lad. Yeah, he had. For the talent, he had no airs and graces, absolutely none. Yeah. You know, he was so. And again, he, he came from non-league football, where yeah. you learn your roots and mm. everything. After that, everything's a bonus. You know, yeah. so yeah. Yeah, top guy. Yeah. Top guy. You, you couldn't have a, you couldn't have a West Ham team of that era, not a Devon. Oh no, 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 no. And then and and that's and that's something which I, again I've learned having done this channel is obviously I've been watching a load of. A load of sort of you know games in sort of that that sort of era, and, and and someone like Alan Devonshire, you know, doing what he was doing on absolute you know sand pitches, you know, it's like bogs of us, bogs of grounds and stuff like that. Could you imagine imagine him on like the bowling green of London Stadium, what he could do there, and how much money he'd be worth now? You know, five thousand pounds we paid for him at the time. Um, incredible, incredible. Seems like a nonsense, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, it really does. He can't um, get. Well, I used to. I, I used to see him in the indoor at Chadwell Heath on the AstroTurf. Yes. Yeah. Similar to the pitches they play on nowadays. Yes. It would have just been. It would have been horrendous for defenders. They just. <laughs> I think that they just walked off the pitch. Uh, yeah. No point. <laughs> no point. Really. <laughs> Trent, Trent, no, Alexander Arnold. Nah, I'm all right, mate. I'm done. I'm done here. But yeah, <laughs> that's brilliant, man. And it's like, and it's just like, I think someone like. With someone like Devonshire, it's like you know, I've really sort of it's become a real education doing this, like watching these players, like doing the season highlights and things like that. And obviously, you know, a lot of it was 
you know, there's a lot of TV, a lot of TV coverage as well there because they had sort of the blackout coverage as well, which is a shame because a lot of the stuff which you know, typically West Ham were doing really well was as much media coverage as there should have been. But uh, yeah, Dev, and he's a top guy, top bloke. We've had him on, and to be honest, Tom, you know, you, I, you know, I was, I was, I was very impressed how quickly, you know, no problem at all getting set up for this today, Dev. Oh, oh. <laughs> I had his wife on the phone. I had. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's got to press a link with that. Oh, good old Dev. God bless him. Right. Okay. We'll put Dev on the left. Let's go with the other wing. Let's go on the right. Who's going to be right midfield then, Tom? Uh, now, this this has caused me a problem. This really <laughs> has. Because I've got to get a player in that midfield, right? Um, And he's not a right winger. But yep. if you asked him to play there, he would. Now, I, I played um, with Mark Ward, um, yep. who was outstanding for the beginning it, you know all the time he was there but his first season it was incredible yeah. um there's there are players there i just i don't want to mention because i'm embarrassed to not have them there <laughs> um and this player people just say well why are you putting him on the right wing because it's the only place i can fit him in <laughs> and, that jeff, and that would be jeff pike oh pikey because, yeah um all the time i was there Pike, he was just, he was just like an engine. If you asked him to do anything, he'd do it. Um, yeah. He was up and down, he could tackle, he could score a goal. He, he was just the, what you would call the workhorse of yes. that team. Yeah. Um, and I, I wouldn't say he was underrated because I think he was very well appreciated. But yeah. I, I, I would struggle for the players I played with over a period of time not to have him in the team. Mm. But because my two centre midfield players, I can't leave them out either. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> this is this is hard work. No, so I'm going, to, I'm going to have to put Jeff out there. So yeah. maybe make um, I don't know, shuffle the, yeah, the can, numbers yeah. around to a modern yeah. day team. You know, so I would put Jeff out there because I could not have him not in the side. And you know, what's really interesting with with like with players like Jeff Pike and um, and even like sort of you know if we go throughout sort of the the sort of generations jeff pike and then um pete butler in sort of the, the, the mid 90s and then hayden mullins in the early 2000s it, it, they're the type of players that when i interview guys like yourselves they always put them in pikey mm-hmm. or it might be or it'll be um you know similar you know i had like people like luke chadwick put like hayden mullins right back because he was just so integral to the team but then from the fans perspective they don't get in the team because yeah. Maybe because they are the more workhorse, you know, they're the more, they're they're always a seven out of ten, seven eight out of ten. They're nothing, you know. They're not not Scott, but he did score some. I mean, Pikey scored that goal with him and Waldy when he gets Man United, where they claimed it was a trading ground incident, but it wasn't. It was a <laughs> it was a fluke. But and someone like Jeff Pike as well. Uh, he's exactly that type of person, isn't it? He's uh, as you said, he'll just run and run and run, do the job. Not not a glamorous player, but you need the people who are going to do their job, and Pikey was one of them. That's for sure. Um, Jeff, we've had him on as well. Young, yeah, top bloke. yeah, and and a top block, you know. But yeah, he was always there if you wanted to talk to somebody about something or anything at all. You know, Pikey, he, he's a nice fella and a, yeah. and a, a very good player. Underestimated, yeah, very good, in my Definitely. opinion. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Okay, let's move into these central midfield players. You've got two of them. Who's your first one? Then you can't leave out. Wow, it's a Trevor, isn't it? You know, I think <laughs> any, anybody who played with. Trevor, it's an honour to start with, yeah. um, and and just amazing to be on a pitch watching him do what he watch him do what he did. Yeah. How he did what he did is beyond my imagination. <laughs> you know, it's um, I, I've I've seen him play for a large part of a match, never touch the ball. Really, but but he's always you know what he did. He'd run with the ball without touching it. He'd put people to go the wrong way without touching the ball. You just thought, what's he actually done on there? But he was just an incredible, you know, he was just an incredible person. And when he did touch the ball, it was just like, it was magic. You yeah. know, he, the, the passes, the little dribbly bits, everything about him. He just had, if he was on that pitch, you knew you were playing with someone very, very special. Yeah. And you couldn't, you know. It, obviously, the recognition he's had, speaks for itself so i mean i can't say anymore i can't add anything to that yeah. nobody would have a west ham team of that era without trevor no. they think no, they no, think no, they were mad you know you have to be crazy it's um 
So yeah, Sir Trevor. Sir Trevor. And again, he was a very, very quiet. No, no, mm. he wasn't actually as quiet off the pitch as people think he was. He had a, a subtle sense of humour. He could say something and just let it hang there, and you know, turn away, and everybody think, yeah, you know, that was funny or that was, you know, cute. Yeah, and off the pitch. Coincidentally, his his daughter was in the same class as my daughter at school um, for a couple of years during GCSEs. Oh, so I used to see him outside the city of London school um, and the Barbican, you know, waiting to pick our daughters up from school. Yeah, I know. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's coincidence, you know. How oh, funny. It, it was, I it was love nice. stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> just, nice just little <laughs> antigotes. Yeah, a little, little, wave, yeah. little wave of pick up. <laughs> yeah, right, okay. Right. <laughs> Let's put Sir Trevor in. Okay, who's the next midfield, a uh, central midfield player? The second one you can't leave out then. Okay, well, when I went to West Ham, I was putting the in the reserves um, to nurture and help bring through the young players and, diff- and some of the players that I played with in the reserve team. It went on to do unbelievable things, you know. Um, Ray Houghton, but he didn't yeah. get West Ham. Let him go. To, yeah. The, um, the other one was Paul Ince, you know. I saw Paul from being a schoolboy right through. Um, he played with me in the first team and he was like a lion. He was just, when he was on, he was on. A bit yeah. sulky, but I, you can't argue. Look what he went on to do. He went to Italy, oh, Manchester United, Liverpool, yeah. et cetera. Um, but the one I'm putting in there, and again, it's a bit like the Billy Barnes and the Trevor. If you've got a legend in this club, legend you've got to put in and I was fortunate enough to be there when they brought Liam Brady oh yes now this might I don't know if surprises people or not they might forget because he was only there for a couple of seasons but Liam I think if you put him in any club he was a magician he Mm. I don't think I could pick a team and justify to myself not putting Liam in there having played having played with him and seen him as a man, watched what his talents were, and his, well, his repu- reputation, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, he's, he's, he had to be in, I, that's why I had to push Jeff out there. Yeah. Because, you know, I couldn't put, Liam, Liam would come and get me if I put him on the right wing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think it, it, it's a luxury to have, I mean, to have Liam Brady and Trevor Brook in the centre yeah. together. You know, that's like a fantasy football team. But then again, that's what this is, I think, to a degree. Yeah, of course it? it is. Yeah. So it's, be, it's you'd... practical because I played with them. Yeah, exactly. So, yes, and Liam. you'd be first of match of the day, wouldn't you? <laughs> Just with those two, <laughs> you can imagine Gary Lineker introducing them two again. But yeah, oh, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a tasty midfield too. Um, right, okay then, Tom, let's go up front. So who's your first striker then? Well, when I arrived, um, they had Paul Goddard. And yeah. Paul, Paul Goddard, that game, go back again. I'm reminiscing to that game at Upton Park. He scored the first goal against me. Um, so Paul Sarge was there. Um, he was a part of the group of the West London, you know, Dev, Parksey, yeah. Sarge, they all came together. So he had an, an exceptionally talented striker, but I wasn't, I didn't play with him for long enough. Yeah. He was in when I wasn't. Maybe a couple of games I played with him. Um, so I think the, the, the top two named themselves for when I played. You know, um, Tony Cotty, you know, yeah. he's just prolific. I uh, don't think there can be many better strikers to play there. I'm mm. I'm not a historian. I'm not a West Ham historian, but I would imagine there weren't that many strikers who could outclass Tony on that no, level. No, um, Tony's Tony's the historian, isn't he? Tony's a stat man. He's just like, oh, yeah. he's incredible, absolutely yeah. incredible. Um, not the he was a young lad when when I was there. Yes, um, so it, it wasn't the easiest to. No, I'm not, this isn't detrimental to him. <laughs> you know, opinionated. You know what he did. He he was right, and you know, it, invariably it was. But I, I've been in some situations where you know somebody's told me to do something. It's just no, I'm doing it my way. But yeah. you can argue with them, you know, because his stats, statistics, and his goals. You know, he wouldn't run all over the park for you. But that wasn't his job. His job was yeah. to get the ball in the back of the net. And yeah. there weren't many better. Certainly, I didn't play with any better than him at West Ham. No, definitely. So he, 
He's yeah, and 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 he's and, and again, you know, we we he's talking about someone someone mentioned Tony Cotty in there at the fan eleven, and we were talking about how nowadays that sort of role that TC played, that sort of you know eighteen yard striker basically. You can look through the modern day and. We don't have them anymore now. Do you know what I mean? It's always like you look at someone like Vardy. He's not your 18, 18 yards. You know, Danny Ings, not anymore. You know, Mikel Antonio, you know, all these Harry Kane, you know, there's, they're more forwards than strikers now, isn't it? And so um, you sort of miss that fox in the box that we always used to like. And everyone used to have big man, little man. And so, yeah, it's, it's changed, isn't it? In terms of the, that's the idea of this, looking back and seeing how football's changed. And it's definitely changing that perspective as well. Um, it's only the designated job and that was to put the ball in the net. Exactly. That, that was it. And if you did that, you know, a goalkeeper's job to keep it out of the net. Yeah. You know, so simple. That, if you break it down like that, that's it's simple. Yeah. It is simple. Yeah. And it's, it's the same now. I mean, you look at, say, Dev and his pomp, you know, you know, you don't get those old fashioned, old fashioned strikers, but the traditional strikers, uh, traditional wingers rather, who sort of stay on the wing and just beat their man and cross it in, and and you know, but you know, they all, in, they all play on the left and they're right footed, and oh, that's something I don't hate. Um, but you know, it's it's something like if football can be a really simple game. I think we complicate it so often it's, by playing. It is a simple game. It is, you know? it is, yeah. But uh, right, okay. TC, who's? Do I need to ask who TC is going to partner up front based on the way you've been describing it? <laughs> not, not really. No, um, I think his his partners is the person who supplied a lot of his goals and scored yeah. a lot of his is Frank. You know, yeah. Frank McAbenny. That's um, he he was completely different character to Tony. Um, sure different character to most of us really but <laughs> he could play you know um he he scored his goals but he could he could play football as well um but an individual very much an individual he 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 could actually you know frank was one of those players who would play to a structure if he was asked to play to a structure whereas tony you know his job is to score goals so yeah and between the two of them they were unstoppable um yeah. They were a partnership, you know. It was like they're both one half of a banana, you know. They just stuck together. Uh, yeah. So Frank and Tony up front. I don't think anybody from that era could argue with those two. No. You know? No. 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 Definitely not. Definitely not. And uh, and that and that's it. You'd have to worry about. It. You've done it now, Tom. It's all done. So you'd have to. <laughs> all I've got to all I've got to do now is change my phone number for all the, <laughs> for all the ones that I've left out. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, they, <laughs> either they, either that or move. Yeah, just move. Yeah, it's easy enough, isn't it? Now uh, they can't come round your house anymore, so you know they're stuck in. They're locked in for three I'm weeks. Safe they'll for forget. A while, yeah. yeah, they'll forget yeah. by then. You know, come this is Christmas then. Um, no, Tom, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Um, no, it's been really, thank you really, for really, really me fun. On. I've enjoyed it. Absolutely yeah. fun. Thank you so much, and obviously thank you to everyone for watching as well. Um, whether you've been on YouTube like share subscribe whether it's you know on, on spotify on podcast give it a share give it a like um and until me and uh, next time for me and tom take care everyone stay safe wash those hands come on your wines and we'll see you again very very soon take care everyone bye bye